Lord, we thank you for our time. We pray that you would um, bless us and fill our hearts with your spirit to see that which you wish to reveal to us in your word and bless our time of fellowship and discussion that we might be able to um, draw from your word as much as we possibly can to move us to be not only hearers of the word but doers also. Lord, I pray that you would fill my heart with your spirit that I may speak from the fullness of your truth and not from my vain ignorance and knowledge. Um, and guide me and direct me as I try to bless uh, my brothers and sisters here, Lord. Pray also that you would um, bless our brothers and sisters who are in worship today, that they might uh, draw near you in the word as well. And uh, pray that you bless us as we go out this week to be able to make your name known in the nations. And we pray this all in the blessed name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. All right, so a quick review for where we have been thus far. So, uh, beginning in Acts 1, we're starting out in the year 33, and we've got chapter 1 and 2. Here we see the ascension of Jesus, the coming of the Holy Spirit. A, frankly, rather simple explanation on the part of the Apostle Peter as to what's going on for the confounded audiences that are seeing what's going on with the members of the church at this time. Uh, not really that complicated uh, an uh, argument for what's going on. He cites some scripture and makes a very simple and clear argument for what's going on that should have been obvious to them. And then, of course, the community grows and is strengthened. Okay, and that's pretty much the wrap-up for chapter 1 and 2. Then we jump ahead, and we jump into this huge segment that is about three to three and a half years later in the events of the church, so about 36, 37. We begin with the healing of the blind man at the gates, and then this uh, begins a moment where Peter's able to enter into the temple to begin proclaiming the gospel to the people there. But right in the middle of his proclamation, he is seized by the authorities, and they're interrogated. And then, um, essentially, they're released. Then the enemy assaults the community. Satan comes against the community by way of Ananias and Sapphira in their deception. And uh, they are quickly dealt with, much to their misfortune. Uh, then the apostles are arrested again. This time they're questioned even more so. They are um, pretty heavily interrogated. Then they practically are accusing the leadership of some pretty harsh things. Uh, which are accurate. And then um, they're put out for a second. Gamaliel, who's one of the leaders amongst them, comes and says, look, if this is of God, we can't stop it. If it's not, it'll go away after a while. Don't worry about it. But even with that, they have them beaten and then thrown out. Then we moved into chapter 6, about the same, same time chunk here, about 37. And the church begins to grow even more because of a major, major event, and that is that, um, well, first of all, it's begun by the dispute between the Hellenistic Jewish Christians and the Hebrew Jewish Christians about the care of the Hellenistic Jewish Christian women, or widows. So the seven deacons, probably from the Hellenistic Jewish Christian camp, yeah, that's a mouthful, um, get selected to be able to care for them, and we are introduced to the character of Stephen. We're introduced to his, not, uh, not only to his character, but his Character. The man is full of faith, he's full of wisdom, which moves us into the second part of chapter 6 in which he ends up in a dispute with three different synagogues in the city to the point where they are just completely confounded. They can't argue against him, and they end up accusing him of horrible things, blasphemy against God, against Moses, and lots of other things. He's seized by the authorities, and they begin interrogating him before the council. Then Stephen basically takes the council to task. He, he says, look, I'm not blaspheming God. Let me show you why, because I'm not saying anything different than anybody else has ever said. But then he, he flat out accuses the council of them blaspheming Moses by not responding to the call of the law and the prophets to be able to see what was coming in Christ. And then they're enraged by this, as, as one would expect in this kind of culture, that they've been accused, their, their honor has been called into account before all, and frankly, probably some of the broader community, and they uh, they take him out and they stone him. And obviously, the Roman authorities don't throw up too much of a mess about this. Again, this was not okay. The Romans were the ones who were responsible for executions, and they took this guy out and stoned him, or killed him. Obviously, the Romans didn't put up too much of a fuss because we don't. I mean, we don't read anything about the procurator being upset about this. This may have been something that the Jews, you know, handily and craftily hid from the authorities' eyes, which is perfectly reasonable. Um, but either way, not too much of a fuss is put up, and the church is devastated. We've, we've got the first death at the hand of the leadership. Um, this opens up a whole new world 
to those who oppose Christ. Oh, you mean we can kill them? Oh, well, we hadn't thought about that, so let's start doing that too. And so this this is the first of you know millions of Christians that have been killed for the last two thousand years at the hands of persecutors. But what happens at this point is that the church is is scattered all over the region, and that's where we're going to start today. Uh, and we see the fulfillment of Jesus' words in Acts 1-8, that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And we see this actually starting to take place. And so we're moving into a new section of the book of Acts as we move on into this. And of course, the last statement we hear in chapter 8, verse 1, at the very beginning of verse 1, is that Saul is standing there holding the coats of those who are stoning Stephen, and Saul approves of his stoning. And so we get this very brief introduction to one Saul, and then we'll come back to him in a little bit. Okay? So any questions with where we've been so far? All right. So if you'll turn to Acts chapter 8, we are going to read verses 1 through 25, and we're going to see what happens here as we um, see the church blast out past the walls of Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria. Starting in uh, verse one, second half of verse 1, chapter 8. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entered house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them and uh, proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did for unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many were paralyzed or lame were healed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the, is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he amazed them with his magic. But when he, they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven, for, forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness, in the bond of in, iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. All right, so um, we're going to come back to this picture in a second. I found this uh, interesting story with this. Um, but let's look at this for a second. I was really proud of my work here, so please, when you're done, uh, much applause is appreciated. Um, so uh, thank you. I, though this was just a copy-paste job. Uh, what I'm about to show you, though, is really impressive. Um, so just a heads up, this right here is Judea, and this is Samaria. I know, you're already amazed, right? So, um, quick question. If, here's where they're at. They're in Jerusalem. And the text says they went, uh, Philip went down to Samaria. 
you don't get the answer. How is this possible? Elevation. Elevation. Yeah, exactly. So to them, everything is up to Jerusalem, down to everywhere else. Okay. They, in fact, maps back then, actually north was turned to the left. So it was a completely different direction altogether. So yeah, he's going up to Samaria in our way of thinking, but he's going down to Samaria because he's going away from Jerusalem. Okay. So Stephen is stoned, and this is a huge blow to the church, and they scatter all across Judea and Samaria. Okay. Uh, some familiar locations that you might know. Here's Bethlehem, Emmaus, uh, Joppa, if you ever watch Veggie Tales, Jonah. Because um, you can get Joppa Joppa there. And then Jericho, uh, Qumran, if you're familiar with the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, this is where that's at, the Dead Sea. Here's the Jordan River, and if you follow that up past Pella, you'll get to the Sea of Galilee somewhere up here. And then, um, where else would you know? That's pretty much it. Bethlehem is right here. I think I mentioned that. Um, but that gives you kind of an idea of the geography. At this point, I find, and this is just me, that watching the maps of where these people are going at this point is very, very helpful because you can you start hearing about all these places that are very unfamiliar, and it's like reading Lord of the Rings. Like, you have no idea what he's talking about. Um, you don't know where any of these places are. You're confused as all get up until you start looking at all these maps, and you're like, oh, okay, that's what it is. So Philip, and this is the deacon Philip, this is not the apostle, um, goes north into Samaria, and he preaches the gospel there. See, wasn't that awesome? And while he's there, they believe. Even this magician, Simon, believes. And then the apostles get word of this. So they send Peter and John up there to check it out. And while they're there, they have the incident with Simon Magus. We'll come back to that in a little bit. And then after it's all over, uh, Philip's going to come back down later. But, but this is what, ha- what just happened as far as geography is concerned. Okay, So that's where they were at. How far is that? Oh, you had to ask. That's not part, that's not part of my impressive presentation. Oh, okay. About okay, 70 miles. Days, Sorry? I think 70 miles. Okay, sure. Okay, it's not that far. Okay. Yeah, it's not too far. I mean, you can, I mean, let me put it this way. This, this is a really easy walk mm-hmm. as far as time-wise is concerned. Um, really close. I mean, I think you can do that maybe in a Five bit. miles. Yeah, it ain't okay. far at all. Okay. So whatever that equivalent is to go there. Um, <laughs> which reminds me of one of the jokes. Someone was telling me one time they were in, in Israel, and they came to this mountain. And they said, oh, this is Mount so-and-so. And the guy's like, it's like a hill. It's like a big hill. He said, and the sure guy looks at him and says, small country, small mountains. <laughs> um, so that's where they've gone to, and that's what's going on here, okay? So um, here's the big question for today. Oh, and by the way, uh, well, we'll come back to that a little bit. But here's my big question for the section we just went over. What was the purpose of the coming of Peter and John to Samaria? Why did they, why did they go? Other than, other than what the obvious text says. To uh, convey the Holy Spirit. Okay. The believers. The so, why did, so why did that not happen when Philip was preaching in Samaria? Because, well, at, that, because at that time the only... But, let me, but when we look at Romans, I accept Christ and I have the Holy Spirit right away, right? Well, yeah. So what's going on with this? I don't know. It's what the charismatics and the non-charismatics... Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit. But... <laughs> But why is this? I mean, let's let's brainstorm here. Why do we think that this is working the way it does? Because at the time, the only people who had been given the Holy Spirit were the people out there at the day of the Pentecost. Okay, who are in Jerusalem. Okay. But what's... To show the authority of the, of the church and the validity of it there in that area also. Okay, kind yeah. Of like Keep... a seal of approval sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, very good. So essentially what's happened here... Gosh, you guys jumped on that real fast. I gotta come up with better questions. Yes, clearly. Um, yeah, I mean, the idea here is that they are sent up as apostles, as emissaries of Christ, essentially, to verify that indeed the gospel has gone out and been believed genuinely amongst the believers in Samaria. Okay, this Philip couldn't do that, and that's one of the reasons why we know that Philip's not the apostle Philip; it's the deacon Philip. How do you know? Because of this very issue, if he if it was the apostle Philip. Peter and John wouldn't have had to go up there. Because as an apostle, Philip could have administered the Holy Spirit, come back, and he would have said, hey, it's, it's all good, because he's an apostle and he has the authority to do that. There are some other late evidence from uh, church fathers that also, um, when, we, when we go through Philip's section here, uh, Philip ends up settling in uh, Caesarea in the north. And there's some various church history that talks about him. And what the details they give about that Philip don't line up with the other 
details about the Apostle Philip. Um, but if Philip, if it had been, my whole argument is that if it had been Philip the Apostle, then Peter and John wouldn't have had gone up there in the first place. Um, he could have administered the Holy Spirit himself. Luke would have well, likely made it clear from the text yeah. too that yeah. this this is not because he just says now Philip. Yeah. Well, the last Philip they talked about was the deacon. Yeah. And they probably would have said now one of the twelve Philip. Yeah. Yeah. It would have made that even clearer. And verse one says it was you know that um, the church of Jerusalem was all scattered throughout the region exactly. of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. <coughs> yeah. So <clears> the <throat> twelve of them stayed in Jerusalem, which by the way. My theory on why they're all there in Jerusalem is the leadership in Jerusalem is probably not going to strike the apostles and kill them because they'd be too afraid of an uprising. You kill someone like Stephen or some you know regular old Joe, and you know nobody's going to make a huge fuss over that. But you strike the apostles and you're going to have a problem. You're going to make a martyr of them essentially. Um, not that they didn't make a martyr of Stephen, but because they've got <coughs> when you're talking about three thousand people are still followers of this movement. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's got a significant base. Yeah. Um, so, very. Uh, so we're pretty sure it's Philip the deacon, obviously. Um, so yeah, the, we 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 do we see this move. We're going to see this later too. This exact same thing happen amongst a new group, um, where the apostle has to go to confirm that indeed there is genuine belief in the coming of the Holy Spirit amongst the group of people that they didn't expect it to come amongst. <coughs> yes, sir. Dylan, in both the situation and the other situation, it, it always sounded like when I when I read this that um, unless you were expecting the Holy Spirit and kind of informed that that was part of what was happening at the time, you know, because like they were like, oh yeah, well, the, you know, it's the wrong baptism. It was just baptism of Jesus. Right. Or no, we, we just had to wherever that other place in Acts is, you know, they're like, oh, we had the baptism of John. Yeah. And they're like, oh no, no, no there's more. Yeah. We're gonna baptize you, and then, you know. Yeah, which is potentially an aspect of that, to sure. <clears throat> because the big question then comes, so the second blessing of normative doctrine, for now. No. Because this is the big charismatic yeah. question, okay? <clears throat> By the way, when I say second blessing, does everybody know what we're talking about? Yeah. No. Okay. So the idea here is, you've accepted Christ, that's the first blessing. Second blessing is that you receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. It's very, very charismatic theology. But is this a value? Um, is this a valid normative doctrine for the present day church? Yeah. Does it always involve speaking in tongues? Because it doesn't say anything about that in this particular passage. No, it doesn't. The argument from a, a group that would uh, uh, support the second blessing is that there is a clear evidence, and the only clear evidence that's seen throughout Scripture is speaking in tongues. Yeah. And so they would say, what's clear here is, they say, um, or is it, um, now the, uh, the apostles of Jerusalem heard, uh, anyways, they, uh, they placed their hands on the Samaritans and they received the Holy Spirit. How do they know that? Well, there's clear evidence, and the clear evidence is speaking in tongues. That's what they would argue. Yeah. So. yeah. But, the, but then that conflicts with uh, the purpose of tongues, that line, and okay. yeah. whatever it is. Exactly. Right. Well, but they would they would argue that 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 is in the context of of, a, of church worship. That is correct. That that and that and what Paul is describing is the context of church worship, not the context of re, the, the the receiving of the Holy Spirit. So that would be two different contexts. And and so. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously, we don't believe that here, so um, so you know where we sit. But but that that's where that doctrine's coming from, okay? But if if we are to say it is a normative doctrine, what's the expense to the church? What is the expense to the church? And by expense, I don't mean money. Um, what cost does that have for the church when we say that we've got you know you have to receive a second blessing? Yeah. I think uh, it spreads information or misperceptions amongst non-Christians. I've had conversations with coworkers in the past where they assume that all Christians have that belief or whatnot. And I remember I invited one coworker to visit the church I was going to at the time, and he said, "Well, you're the people at your church. They don't hang their tongue out and waggle it back and forth <laughs> and yell and yell yeah. up at the ceiling, do they?" And I said. No, that's you know, I just I had to explain to them. Yeah. So exactly. 
Yeah. Would this imply that the Holy Spirit always had to be given by another believer? Or an apostle? Or by, perhaps, yeah, or by an authority. An Possibly. Authority. So imagine a church where you've got people who are in the church who have received the same blessing. And then you have other people who haven't. They're saying they're not saved. Yeah, they're, they're either saying they're not saved or you've created this kind of second-class Christian. You know what I mean? Um, but also you lose scalability because if you're saying <clears throat> the only way to do this is direct transmission of an apostle where someone who's already received it laying their hands on you. Like, you can't scale that as quickly and you can't have a, have a, a non-apostle go as a missionary you know, he's like, oh great, well you're all saved now but I gotta arrange this trip to get somebody from the yeah, exactly. corporate to come down here and <laughs> yeah. do the second part because I can't, you know, God won't give it to you without the, you know time. Yeah. Yeah. the other thing is uh, I think it would cause a person to question you know, was my trusting in Jesus Christ for my salvation, or was that not good enough, you know So these are all good answers. Um, no, we, and I, I want to say Cyprus has actually got a statement, a statement they made on this, um, you know, bylaws, constitution, but um, obviously we don't believe this here, but my whole argument goes back to, to Romans. Paul makes it very clear, if you've received Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. It, it's pretty clear there. Um, there are other aspects to this which are kind of more in the periphery of the discussion, but but this is not a normative doctrine, and it shouldn't be treated as such. It creates way too many problems. So what? So yes. what is the per- why? Why did in this so, case? So yeah. why in this case does the Holy Spirit not come until the apostles? My my whole argument to be made is exactly what we've got an answer over here is that the whole idea is the apostolic signifying of yes, it is true. In fact belief has come amongst the Samaritans. So there is, those who are the emissaries of Christ himself have gone and verified. That's the whole purpose. And you're going to see this exact same thing happen when we get to chapter 10. Well, it's starting to really get out of the Jewish community. Yeah, and especially when we go to this next one, it's going to move, you know, start moving that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the whole idea is just the apostolic approval. Okay? They're confirming. Yeah. I'm sorry. They're confirming, they're confirming with Jesus. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. I mean, don't get me wrong. The the coming of the Holy Spirit and the belief amongst them, that's, that's not in the apostles' hands. Okay. But to be able to be there to verify and witness it is a huge deal because then the apostles can come back and say, yes, it is true, and here's how we can verify it because we've seen the Holy Spirit come amongst them. And no one's going to argue with that. So it's a, it's a really big deal in the administration of the church and the expansion of the church into areas that are non-Jewish. So would it would it be possible to consider that it is uh, normative for a for there to be a coming of the Holy Spirit in an in an area that is that is kind of a new area, um, for instance, <clears throat> tracking with our our uh, outline here. We're now into Samaria, right? And so, the whole the Holy Spirit is being passed into Samaria now. The same thing is going to happen in chapter ten when we move into another area. Yeah. So, is it possible to consider that there will be such a way of the Holy Spirit coming upon an area that's new, or a new people, or a new group? Um, I mean, would that be considered apart from a Evangelist or someone of that sort coming to that area? Um, no, you, that, that just that there is, I mean, in both instances we're talking about in chapter right here with the Samaritans and then with Cornelius amongst the Gentiles, you have an incident where the Holy Spirit comes very demonstratively. Right. Not, and and in, the corn, uh, in both events, the 8 and 10, I don't believe either one of those explains how they know that the Holy Spirit comes, but the Holy Spirit comes in such a way that it's very evident. Yeah. They're like, whoa. And, and in fact, I guess Peter actually says that he, the Holy Spirit came in a way similar to the way uh, he came upon us, which would imply possibly uh, 
speaking in tongues. So I guess my my question is, when when the when this gospel moves into an area that is new, where where they've not, there is no such presence. Would it be likely to consider that there would be such a demonstration of the Holy Spirit in that that's similar to that? Well, I, I would say two things in that regard. I would say. First of all, you never see this happen apart from the proclamation of the word. Mm-hmm. That's that's definitive. So I don't think this is going to happen just out of nothingness where you just have out of the middle of nowhere, no evangelist has ever been there, the Boom. gospel's never been proclaimed. <laughs> oh, the Holy Spirit's there. You, you don't see that. That is not normative for the way that the scriptures speak of it. But I'm not uncomfortable with the idea that an evangelist goes into an area, preaches there, the Holy Spirit comes to them as they as they believe, not long time after and again not having to send someone down from corporate to to Mm -hmm. verify that it's come amongst them but that you might see evidence of it in this way i will say i i'm a very cautious continuationist if you're familiar with the terminology and that is i still believe that the god still works these miraculous sorts of things but i'm very cautious about when people claim to have seen them or claim that these things happen but One of the things that I do not believe God is beyond is using the practice of tongues to speak languages that are unknown to be able to make that connection initially. I don't think that that's out of bounds. Um, But that is a very... I think um, You could snatch that out of my hand pretty easily. I think what's interesting about that, though, too, is is it gives us an understanding, at least in my mind, it helps me to understand that, you know, why someone who is overseas or... In a, in a pocket of, of the world that doesn't have the, the scriptures and doesn't have uh, a, a representation of, of a Christian body. Why is it that we hear a lot more of those kind of miraculous things happening out there yeah. and less within our own community? And I think that we have two examples here of where the, scriptures, the, the Holy Spirit does come in a way that seems more miraculous or more evident than what we may have may be seeing happening in the Jerusalem church or within the possible yeah. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. Like you hear a lot of Muslim and Indian, you know, converts yeah. having dreams of Jesus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Generally speaking, people who are more or cultures that are more attuned to the spiritual mm-hmm. world uh, tend to see more of the miraculous than people who are more in the reasoned West, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, aren't there you know, back on the, on the second blessing now in this, or mm-hmm. the coming of the Holy Spirit in a very obvious way, I mean, aren't, there's just really a, a few examples of that here in the New Testament. I mean, it's yeah, not, very few. It's not as if in Ephesus and Colossus, yeah, exactly. Places, you don't want to see that. Exactly. So, to me, that says it's not more yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's another good argument. Yes? Kind of off question. Sure. Mm-hmm. We um, like off questions in here. <laughs> Has there ever been any evidence of uh, a people group that didn't have the gospel, but they knew about Jesus maybe through like an angel showing up or something, or there wasn't a direct human missionary? But Not that I know of, and I would be very nervous if someone said that that's been the case. Okay. It, it would be very not normative of what Scripture demonstrates. So, I, But I've never personally heard that. All right, let's move into our next section here. We're starting in uh, verse 26, chapter 8. Philip has uh, left Jerusalem. He's going south now. Um, This time, whenever he says he goes down from Jerusalem, it actually works for us Westerners. Um, It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, (coughs) court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join the chariot, uh, this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you were reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was like this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shears is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this, his generation? 
for his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when, he came, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Um, and the scripture that he's citing back in verse 32 and 33 is Isaiah 53 there, uh, which is pretty familiar to all of us, hopefully. Um, so let's, let's take another look at my handy-dandy map here. So Philip has come back to Jerusalem and now um, from Samaria, and now he's going to head south until he gets somewhere in here. I just picked this place because that's where the map picked. You can see the little arrow pointing up. Um, but here he meets this Ethiopian eunuch who is reading uh, the scriptures. And it's likely this guy is some sort of proselyte or something of the sort who is a God-fearer, if you will. And he's bringing the scripture back with him. And he's reading it, and then Philip comes up and explains it to him, but explains it to him, obviously, the right way. And uh, the, the uh, eunuch believes. And then after he's baptized, the spirit leads Philip away very quickly. Uh, and Philip continues up through here until he gets to Azotus, and he preaches there. And then he continues up until he gets all the way up here, I'm sorry, it's off the chart, uh, to Caesarea Maritima. There is, uh, there's actually two different Caesareas. There's Caesarea Maritima and Caesarea Philippi. Uh, but this is where Philip settles and uh, makes the gospel known there. Uh, but this is the track he makes. Needless to say, um, he took the long way around. Um, so this is the path that he's just taking geographically. Okay. So here's my question for this particular section. Why is this event important in the structure of Acts per chapter 1, verse 8? Because he starts talking to someone who is even beyond Judea and Samaria, but to Ethiopia. Yeah, so now we're starting to, uh, in fact, I read something uh, this week that said that during this time period, Ethiopia was considered the end of the world. Um, Still is. Um. But this is, by Ethiopian tradition, this is considered the beginning of the Ethiopian church. And this guy goes back to his land and supposedly proclaims gospel there, and, and then it all starts from there. But yeah, you're seeing a foreshadowing here of what's about to come with the um, gospel moving out amongst those who are even beyond Samaria and Judea into Gentile territory. Um, this guy's not purely a Gentile, obviously he's a God-fearer, he's a proselyte, um, but we're not quite to a full-blown Gentile who's really like a Roman or a Greek. Um, this is still kind of in the periphery of Judaistic culture, if you will, um, but that's all about to change. I don't want to linger too long here, um, but that's essentially where this sort of narrative is beginning to lead us. Okay. So he's going to take this back to Ethiopia. Presumably, that that no is tradition. No one else is going there. I mean, you have Holy Spirit movement there. Presumably, the okay. we we don't know. I mean, I would assume at this point that that's essentially what happens. Um, and since this guy is would be considered generally within the periphery of more of the Jewish culture because of his status, I would assume that he probably receives the Holy Spirit normative of what we would expect now, because they've already seen the Holy Spirit come amongst that group of people, um, and then takes it back there. So do they just have a tradition, or do they have some? I, there's no scripture. They, I mean, do they, do they have do they have things that they're like, oh, this is the second century Ethiopian church? I, the, I Ethio- the Ethiopian Orthodox Church would claim this yeah. is their their beginning. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But they didn't have corporate to go and validate it. So. No, they didn't have corporate. But again, since he's on the periphery of sort of the Jewish culture, that particular group has already been verified by the apostles, so they don't need corporate to come down for that one. Yeah, but his next thousand converts. Would presumably receive the Holy Spirit as he did. Um, but we don't know. Uh, it, there, there's a lot there that's left to tradition in kind of the mists of time. Part of it, too, might be that there's a little bit of a sense of Philip's, Philip's ministry has been, 
has been uh, validated. validated. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And so therefore, that Philip doesn't need to be validated anymore. No. Wherever he goes, he now proclaims the gospel appropriately. So. He didn't speak in tongues, though. Right? No, he didn't. Motion. Didn't even mention him receiving the Holy Spirit. He's a vice president. That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Regional manager. COO, if you will. A regional manager. But this is also really big in this regard. We're starting to see the beginning of a totally different way of doing things. In the Old Testament, when Israel was founded, they were intended to be a light to the nations. But the way in which that was supposed to happen was that the nations were supposed to come and see. Remember Solomon? In all his wisdom, what happened? People came to People find out. Came to find out. Okay, it's one of the high points, at least early on in his reign, it's one of the high points of Israel's history. But the nations came and saw. Now we're seeing a totally different way of doing things. Now it's all about go and tell. Okay, so no longer are the nations supposed to come to us to find out. We are supposed to go to them and tell them about it. Very different approach, which also works in a microstructure too. Your neighbors shouldn't have to come over to your house to find out. Well, they can if you want to invite them over, but <laughs> you're the one supposed to make the initiation. Okay. That's why this is shocking. All right, so um, let's talk about the conversion and ministry of Saul. So, starting in chapter nine, verse one, we're going to jump back to Saul. In fact, it begins with "But Saul." Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Did you guys ever read that book, Meanwhile, Back at the Ranch? I still remember that phrase as a kid. No? Did Doug, do you remember it? <laughs> no, I just remember the phrase. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the ranch. <laughs> but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? (coughs) And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul arose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold... He is praying, and he has seen a vision in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is chosen he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he arose and was baptized and taking food he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples of Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for the purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he came to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. 
So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. But they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. So, back to our map here for just a second. So, here in Jerusalem, uh, Paul gets sanctioned to follow the followers in, that are in Damascus. Now, when the, when the church blasts out across the landscape, chances are what ended up happening is in multiple different cities, there were little enclaves of Christians that had gathered, and Damascus was one of those. He hears about it, he says, I want to go up there and do it. The chief priests give him authority to do that, and so they give him papers to take up there with him. So he travels this road up to Damascus. Now before he gets there, he sees a vision of the Lord who blinds him on the road, and then they end up having to walk him into Damascus. And he's there amongst them now. While he's teaching them, or while he's there, he's baptized and he has a newfound faith. Um, but while he's there, the Jewish leaders are just confounded. He, he's proving them wrong all the time, and clearly proving that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God. And so they plot to kill him. So they end up having to, and, and they're guarding the gates. They can't get out through the gates. Um, so the disciples have to lower him in a basket off the side of the wall to the ground, um, which would make me vomit because I'm totally afraid of heights. Um, in fact, I was joking with Emily yesterday. She wants some branches cut off the base of our pine trees. I said, well, you can get up in that ladder and do that if you want to. Because I ain't getting up there. Um, but uh, they lower him down, and then where does he go? Back home. Uh, no, he doesn't go to Jerusalem. He actually goes to Arabia. Kind of. How am I getting there with that? Well, that like oh, man, it's off the screen. Good grief. Man, my map is going so well. In Galatians 1.17, we actually find out he did not go directly to Jerusalem. He actually left and went into Arabia. Eventually, he does find his way back to Damascus, and he's... Uh, now, when we say three years, what we mean is... Oh, I don't have to get up. i got a pointer. Um, so the process of him going to Arabia and then being back in Damascus for a time... Uh, he talks about being back in Damascus for a little while before he comes to Jerusalem in Galatians. Um, when he comes back, this whole process is three total years. We actually don't know how long he was in Arabia itself. I mean, he may have been in Arabia for... Two years and twelve or eleven months, then come back and was Damascus for like a month, we, or he was there for like a month and then came back here for two years and eleven months. We don't know. There's some mixture of the of the time period there, but all told, from the point he's converted, been there and come back before he comes back down to Jerusalem, we got a total of three years. So we have now moved ahead to the year forty. So now he comes back to Jerusalem, and here he is proclaiming the gospel. Yes. I think one of the study Bibles I read, it said that he went to Nabatea. I don't he, know where they got that. He may have. If he did, I'm not sure where they're getting that from. I mean, they may be getting it from somewhere. I just, no, I'm not sure. Um, Nabatea is going to be on the other way, yeah. down here. I mean, he could. I mean, for all I know, I mean, he he was wandering in the desert for a while. <laughs> all over the place. I wouldn't suggest wandering through this area if I were him, but <laughs> hey, the Lord promised that he was going to be his apostle, so maybe he can just go do whatever he wants over here. Um, but, like Abraham, who wanders out here and like, oh, you're going to be my, yeah, but I'm dying. i got to go down to Egypt. Um, who knows, you know. Um, but then he does come back to Jerusalem. The disciples are freaking out because they think this guy is going to kill them. And he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. He actually ends up getting approval from one of the disciples and Barnabas, of all people. Very important uh, seal of approval there. And he starts making the Hellenistic Jews really mad. Now, these are not Hellenistic Jewish Christians, obviously, because I don't think the church is going to plot to kill him. Okay? Um, these are the Hellenistic Jews who are mad at him and are plotting to kill him. So it's like everywhere this guy goes, people want to kill him. Um, so the disciples are like, look, we've got to get you out of here. So what they do is they take him up to Caesarea. I'm okay, sorry, it's 40. They take him up here to Caesarea and then put him on a ship, presumably, to go to Tarsus. Now, Tarsus... You can follow it all the way up here. Is in the far southeast corner of Turkey, near the border of modern-day Turkey and Syria. Okay, so it's way up here. Um, it's also his hometown. 
So he goes up there and uh, presumably starts work up there as well. But this is where we leave Saul. He gets shipped off because there's too much trouble going on um, for him in Jerusalem. It's just too dangerous for him to be there. And so the big question I have with this, and I'm kind of leaving this open because I want to see what you guys can go with. Them. Why is the conversion of Saul a significant event at this point in the narrative? Why put this here? Why? What's going on here? Well, he's kind of the main actor for the rest of Acts. Okay, true. Yeah, we're intru- it's definitely an introduction to Saul, obviously. Like, com- really almost true. like we got the introduction to Stephen earlier, we're now getting the introduction to Saul. Sorry, you were saying? Well, it's just that, yeah, I mean, you don't even hear again, uh, hear from uh, Peter again until you get into the right at the end of his life. Of those yeah. two, two I mean, we're going to hear about Peter for a little bit here in just yeah. a second, but then after that we, we definitely move into a big shift to Paul narrative. It keeps, it shows that you're going to have, that it's not going to be smooth sailing like the apostles for everybody. That there's going to be a lot of people who are going to have to suffer really hard and going to have a lot of people hate them for what they're saying. I mean, it's already evident, but this is just, I mean, you said it's only like three years between the time that Damascus decides to plot with him. He returns, then goes down to Jerusalem where they say, we're going to kill you. And then he has to go somewhere else. And imagine the high priest's shock. <laughs> what does that say about soteriology? Because obviously, uh, you know, Saul of Tarsus wasn't really a seeker. Yeah, what does it say about soteriology? Um, I don't know, something happened to him, but he doesn't, he doesn't seem to have been seeking right before that. I think... Uh, I think the book of Acts has this notorious... Christianity in his own way. Yeah, exactly, in his own way. <laughs> it's very personal. Um, now, I think the book of Acts is one of those books that it really it throws your soteriology out the window. Um, if you're trying to wrap up your soteriology into a nice little package and put a bow on top... Go someplace else. <laughs> go someplace else. Okay. Um, this, this is really... You really have to realize that the sovereignty of God is... It's like for... For... I don't want to say Arminian because Arminians are very sovereignty focused as well, unlike what most people caricature them as. But if you're in the in a camp where it's very much, there's just enough, or I guess Pelagians would be a good example. Um, there's just enough good in you to choose Jesus, and it's all up to you. This kind of thing just blows your soteriology out the window. If you're a Calvinist, then there are other aspects to Acts which are going to blow your mind too. It's just this is not the place where you want to go to shore up your soteriology. Yes. What's soteriology? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. So soteriology, thank you. Um, by the way, if I ever do that, don't feel shy about jumping out there and well, saying... My fault. No, no, you're good. <laughs> soteriology is just the theology of salvation. How does salvation actually work from point A to point B? I'm a sinner. How do I become part of the church? What's that whole process? What all is involved? So, um, and there are different camps and different ideas about how that works. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're getting an introduction to Paul, uh, Saul. You're getting an introduction to the fact this is about to go less smooth sailing. Yes? So what a good argument for the fact that he probably did spend a lot of time in Arabia is if that was about three years, surely the disciples would have heard that he was preaching the gospel. Um, I mean, because it's not that far away. And if he had been doing it for three years in Damascus, they would have heard about it by Possibly, now. Possibly, yeah. But it seems like they were like, oh, this is still a bad guy. So obviously yeah. in three years, news hadn't really made it down that he was a totally different person. Yeah. I mean, but, but you also got to consider, um, imagine that, I mean, we do this in America, too. We hear, I mean, I just heard this week that um, a, you're going to have to forgive me because my news is really bad, that a candidate for a job that uh, President Obama had suggested got struck down mm-hmm. like a civil rights lawyer Definitely. because he had, defi- uh, help me out here, he was, this guy was up for what position? Civil rights yeah, so head of civil yeah. rights division, okay. and he got struck down by the committee that's responsible for that because long time ago, mm-hmm. long time ago, this guy defended a, a guy who had killed a police officer. Mm-hmm. He, he handled the appeals. Yeah. Even we have a long memory. Okay, so Saul goes off to Damascus, or is going off to persecute the church. That's the last Jerusalem hears about this guy, and then he's preaching in Damascus a little bit. And all they're hearing back are rumors that, oh, Paul became a Christian, was preaching, and then he disappeared into the wilderness. They don't even know where he's at. And then all of a sudden, three years later, he shows up at their doorstep. 
there's going to be suspicion. I mean, it, it, three years is not that long in the grand scheme of things. So, and especially in the East, their memories are way longer than ours are. Um, so there, there's a lot of a lot of trepidation on their part. But then they, but then when they see him and what he's doing, they can't deny what's going on. Um, he so. later shores up what he was doing. Do what? He later shores up what he was doing. Yeah, exactly. And I think, to me, one of the things that probably happened in Arabia, he was really, okay, tossing over all those scriptures in his mind. How is this work? I, I can't deny what I saw on the road to Damascus. How am I fitting this all together now? Some say that's where he had the visit to heaven or whatever. Yeah, I don't know anything. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Because I'm all like, Muhammad went to Jerusalem. Like, what? <laughs> Too much. Um, yeah, no, no, yeah. And, and potentially that's exactly right. Um, the the visit into heaven. And it's plausible that, the, the, that maybe the part where it talks about him, he may have left Arabia before he was... Uh, and came, uh, before he was persecuted, possibly yeah. I mean, we don't there's, have a, there's a lot of chronology with Damascus. His time in Damascus that's really messed up. He could have gone to Arabia, come back, and then started preaching. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of my take on it, but um, but there's a lot of chronology issues, and during that three years are a little difficult. All right. So last section. Oh, one quick question. What's up with blindness in the Bible? <laughs> mm. oh, sorry, that sounded like a really funny question. <laughs> But how, do, how does the Bible, how does the scripture use blindness as a symbol? Well, first of all, it's incurable because, you know, we can replace the eyeballs. With, yeah, exactly. But you can't retrain the brain no. to see if a person's been blind from birth. Yeah. So you in fact, the, brain. <laughs> the scripture says very clearly in the Old Testament, the only one that can heal the blind is God himself. Yeah. Very clear about that. And yet we see the blind healed over and over again in the Gospels. We see Saul blinded and then healed again. But symbolically, how is blindness function in the scriptures? Unbelief. It's unbelief, exactly. And so he gets to Damascus, and Ananias prays with him, and he's able to see, and he believes. But any time you read a story about blindness, it is always connected with unbelief. Even in the Gospels, one of my favorite series of stories um, I know I've talked to you guys a little bit about bookends in narrative literature. So you start one part of a narrative with one kind of story, you end up with the same kind of story, and you got something different in between. These bookmarks mark and highlight an aspect of what's in between. So in one of the Gospels, you read about a man healed of blindness on one end, a man healed of blindness on the other, and then there's a whole discussion about spiritual blindness in between. There's a story about how they can't understand he's the Son of God. So you're like, why are these two stories of blindness? And then, oh, you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Was to highlight the spiritual blindness in between those two events. Okay, so when the gospel writers are putting their stories together, they highlight that by putting those stories in between stories about healing of the blind. So when the scales fall off Paul's eyes, it's it's a it's not just a physical ailment; it's a symbol of his now spiritual sight to be able to clearly see that Jesus is the Christ. It also uh, kind. Of and, uh, it also makes you have to depend on somebody because yeah. you don't know where you're going yeah. or depend on something. So maybe that's another aspect to it of I have to de- you have to depend on Christ to a degree because you have to trust that he is who he says he is. Yeah. All right, let's move into our last section for today which is actually kind of a bridge into the next chapter, but uh, we start in verse 32. Now Peter went here and there among them all. He came down also to the saints who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. What an unfortunate name. Um, (laughs) She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them, and when he arrived... They took him to the upper room. All the windows stood, or actually, all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics. 
and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. So geographically, here was Philip's travels. Now notice the city he went through. Ah, so here's Peter. Oh, gee. So there are believers in Lydda probably because of Philip's ministry. Okay. Um, then they hear about Aeneas being healed, being raised um, from his ailment, and they ask for him to come to Joppa because Tabitha has died, and he heals her and raises her from the dead. And it becomes known throughout that area. Okay. Now, um, here's my question with this particular story, and focusing a little bit on Aeneas, but more on the raising of Tabitha. What is the function of this event, and what evidence is there for this function? Right. Think ahead, too, but because uh, our next story is going to be him going to the Gentiles in Caesarea with Cornelius. But what is the function of this event, and what evidence do we have for that function? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> well, Jesus said some things. He's like, the miracles that you see here, y'all are going to do this. So ah, yeah, yeah. Anymore. Okay, so keep going with that. And so, you know, these are people that they're believing in the apostles because of the Holy Spirit. You know, like it happened in some of the other places. But this is this is another uh, kind of testimony by God to say, I approve of this. That these types of things don't happen apart from me, so you you should believe this. And these are these are places that have maybe uh, not had as much transit with Jerusalem. And, okay. You know they didn't have the movement there, but yeah. as soon as these things happen, oh now there's a lot of believers. Yeah. And okay. So, and, and only at point, you know. Yeah. They heard the story of Lydda and invited him to Java. Yeah. So you can see it spread. Exactly. So he's definitely in Java because of what happened in Lydda, so it's kind of a stepping stone to him to get to Java. This was also like a big deal um, for a lot of the Jews at the time. There was a whole lot of people that there is no resurrection. Yeah, you know, like, there's a whole like, camp that doesn't believe They had that. arguments about this all the time. Yeah. You know, Jesus had arguments with them. And so when you have one in your house with all yeah. these widows... Yeah. It's kind of a big deal. Yeah. And only two... Only, because, <laughs> only two people were raised from the dead before this that we know of, Lazarus, uh, Lazarus and Jesus himself. So There's one other one. But, but I'm glad you say that because this brings up a good point. Who, he, uh, Zach, I don't know if you heard him, he said there are, there are two other people. There's Lazarus, Jesus himself, but there's also another one. A very, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jairus' daughter. Hint, hint. No. No, the centurion's servant is ill, but he doesn't die. Jairus' daughter dies. Where he lays on top of her. What? Isn't there one where he lays on top of her? I'm, I'm not. In the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Old Testament. Yeah. But think about that story with Jairus' daughter. And even he even calls her Talitha. Yeah, check this out. This is so cool. In the story with Jesus, in Aramaic, he says, Talitha kum. What does Peter say? Tabitha kum. We see him being taken up into the upper room where the body is. So what are we seeing here with this narrative in Acts? He's doing the upwards that Jesus did. He's, he's being compared. There's a comparison being made between Peter and Jesus. I mean, obviously, they're not claiming Peter is the same as Jesus. But there is a kind of a, a narrative seal of approval on what Peter is doing. He's being seen as the emissary of Jesus. Not in the Catholic sense, obviously. But, or, or not as the vicar, if you will. But, but he is clearly an apostle and a messenger of Jesus. Because this very narrative is being brought up and compared to the incident that happened with Jairus' daughter. Okay, And that, if you're looking for a specific scripture to look at for that, uh, I've got it on another page here. Mark 5.41 is where Mark actually, uh, Matthew and Luke don't record the, the Aramaic words. Mark does. And he says, uh, Talitha kum. 
uh, kum means rise. Okay, so Talita it means little girl, and uh, Tabitha is the name of the lady here. So there's very direct connections being made. Yes. Um, part of the evidence for the function is that uh, in verse 42 it says, "Me, if they came to Nazareth, I'll doubt that many believed in the Lord." And you know, those folks were close enough that they could go investigate this for themselves. Yeah. And uh, obviously, if, if it hadn't been true, then you know, it would have quickly been uh, yeah. eradicated from uh, the narrative. Yeah. I don't know Joppa during this time. Is it still a, still a fairly um, busy cosmopolitan port? I said big city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone, everyone's coming through Joppa and talking about yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. Isn't that port Tel Aviv uh, is located at? Uh, yeah, just like there, right? Maybe. My Joppa, modern geography yeah. of Israel is horrible. Um, I think Tel Aviv is right there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah still exactly big, big, there. big port city. There, yeah. There was another resurrection. It was Luke 7. Oh yeah, there's the the widow's the widow, yeah, 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 that's what I was yeah. talking about. Yeah. Again, I say, I went to seminary. And then there's uh, all the people that were walking around during the resurrection. Yeah, exactly. And there were all the people that were raised after the resurrection. Um, so yeah, so th- there's a very direct connection being made with Jesus here. This is going to be important because as Peter goes up to meet Cornelius in the next chapter, we're going to talk about next week, he's going up with that level of authority. That's going to be very important because it's one thing to go to Samaria, well, they're half breeds, or to go to proselytes and God fears. Well, they're still kind of in the Jewish periphery, but to go to the Gentiles, this is kind of the extra seal of approval before he goes out and he's fixing to go bring a, a true. Roman, Greco Roman Gentile into the faith. This is a big, big deal. So, the big thing that we've seen, go back. The big thing that we've seen today is that you are part of this world. You're part of the end of the world, and we're going to see this even more tomorrow. It is our job to go and tell. Okay? Please don't forget that. It's no longer come and see. You see them going from Jerusalem. You don't see them staying there and expecting everybody to come hear about it. They're going. And even when they stayed, notice what God did. He permitted the stoning of Stephen. And it sent the church out. Okay? Big, big deal. So as we consider what our responsibility is as a church, we are sent to go and tell.